What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Josh Sullivan history video. So this one is interesting. This is how China almost had another dynasty, and if it happened. So I'm getting, this is kind of a mix of a history and an alt history video, I guess. And I'm not sure what time period this is, but I'm going to guess this is post-Chinese Civil War, or maybe, you know, a plan that they had post-Chinese Civil War. Not entirely sure, but regardless, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. It's me, Josh. When you think about ancient China, the first thing that probably comes to your mind China. are its many dynasties and emperors, and its dynastic cycle bringing one dynasty to power, seeing glory and success before weakening and being overthrown. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. This is, China had this interesting concept called like the Mandate of Heaven, which is it's similar but like very different to fe feudal Europe, right? So feudal Europe, you had uh, the divine right of kings, where kings were you know in the philosophy was that kings were appointed by God. Uh, China, you have something sort of similar, but it's ba you can lose that favor <clears throat> basically by being conquered, right? This is the justification. Uh, but a lot of the time, this would actually lead to like internal revolt. If the people were revolting against you, it means you've lost the divine mandate of heaven and stuff like that. Very interesting philosophy to get into, but anyway. It can be hard to believe that this China wasn't that ancient after all. In fact, it wasn't until only a little over a hundred years yeah. ago that dynastic China would cease to exist. But after China's last dynasty fell, one man attempted to bring back dynastic rule and nearly succeeded. So what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, instead of a republic, China had continued its ancient tradition and established a new dynasty? So first, how it so I wonder what he's gonna get. Into. Is it gonna be like a a system similar to like the current British system, where you have a parliament as well, right? Because obviously that's what the Japanese did. The Japanese adopted a lot of the systems from the British, and then after World War II, had a very kind of American-ish system established on them, although it still has some aspects of the British system. Or is it gonna be more a total? Uh, monarchy, like an absolute monarchy. I wonder which way he's going to go with that. How exactly did this situation come about? In the late 19th century, China was under the rule of the Manchu Qing Dynasty, which had ruled since the mid-1600s. And though the Qing saw successes at first, the 19th century wouldn't exactly be too kind to them, being dubbed the Century of Humiliation. By the 19th century, China had fallen far... The funny thing about, like, the idea of the century of humiliation is that it was a lot longer than a century, right? Like, if, if you think about it, the European powers were more or less doing what they wanted to uh, against the Qing pretty much since they showed up, right? Obviously, once you get to, like, the, you know, the 1800s, the 19th century, the disparity becomes a lot more drastic, right, post-industrial revolution. But uh, the Europeans were already a lot more advanced pretty much from the point that they started showing up en masse, right? Like, you do have, like, limited trade, like Marco Polo and stuff like that uh, prior to that and the whole Silk Road where they're on a lot more equal footing. But by the time you get to, like, the, you know, the 16, 1700s, there's already a, a drastic difference. In the 1800s, it just ramps up to another level because of Industrial Revolution. So the century of humiliation is ca kind of a funny concept because it's really more like three or four centuries of humiliation are behind Europe in terms of technological development. And as European empires begin to spread across the globe, China would get repeatedly whacked by foreign powers, such as Britain in the Opium Wars and Japan in the First Sino-Japanese War, leading to immense foreign influence in China. As a result, many in China began pushing back against the Qing government, calling for modernization and reform. And to their credit, the Qing did try to do so on numerous different occasions, resulting in the creation of powerful modernized armies such as the Beiyang Army. However, conservatives in the Qing court would repeatedly thwart attempts to reform, and when the First Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1895, China would be easily defeated by Japan. Needless to say, nationalists in China were sick of this, as some, such as a man named Sun Yat-sen, would begin pushing for the outright overthrow of the Qing dynasty and the institution of a republic. And as time went on and the Qing dynasty continued to fail at reform, discontent continued to grow, resulting in numerous revolts breaking out. 
In October of 1911, after the Qing had attempted to nationalize the construction of local railways, revolutionaries in Wu Cheng would stage a protest with the Qing sending in the military. Some of the revolutionaries had made some bombs in preparation for a potential revolt, and on October 9th, one of them accidentally went off, with the Qing now pushing for the arrest of revolutionaries with a revolt breaking out the next day, starting the Wu Cheng Uprising on October 10th, 1911. The uprising proved successful, repelling Qing forces, leading the revolt to spread all across southern China and even into Mongolia and Tibet, starting what would be known as the Xinhai Revolution. Sun Yat-sen would then assume leadership of the rebellion and proclaim the Republic of China with himself as its provisional president. Now, let's shift gears over to a man named Yuan Shikai. Yuan Shikai was a general in the Qing military and was placed in charge of the Beiyang Army, the most powerful and modernized force in all of China. And after the revolt broke out, the Qing government quickly called on Yuan to help them stop the rebellion. And this is when Yuan realized something. Because he led the most powerful force in all of China, He's a this kingmaker. meant that whoever he sided with would win the war, making him the most powerful man in all of China. Yuan would end up gaming the Qing government, forcing the regent to resign and making him prime minister. However, he then realized that if the Qing were to win, they wouldn't need him anymore and would just cast him aside. So he then began negotiations with the revolutionaries, agreeing to force the child Xuantong Emperor, better known as Pu Yi, to abdicate if he could replace Sun Yat-sen as the provisional president of China. The revolutionaries, who were in a weak military state, agreed as the Qing dynasty would end with Sun Yat-sen leaving Chinese politics and Yuan Shikai becoming the provisional president. Yuan ruled essentially as a military dictator, centralizing authority in himself. But the revolutionaries, who began to coalesce behind the Kuomintang, or KMT, the Nationalist Party of China, began to push back against Yuan. In 1913, the KMT won a massive victory in the parliamentary elections, which seemed to signal that they were about to wrestle power away from Yuan Shikai. That is until their leader was mysteriously assassinated. <laughs> I'm sure that Yuan had nothing to do with it. But anyways, after this, Yuan would bribe and threaten the KMT members of parliament into electing him to a five-year term as president, which the revolutionaries weren't happy about. Sun Yat-sen would help to stage what came to be known as the Second Revolution meant to oust Yuan Shikai, but due to Yuan's hold over the military, the revolution proved a failure with Yuan solidifying his control. After this, Yuan completely reorganized the government. He would begin to clamp down on the KMT and dissolve the parliament, replacing it with 66 of his own dudes, and even reorganize provincial governments, putting a military general in charge of each province, which would soon after come back to bite him. Me yeah, you have all these generals fighting over all this territory. And it's uh, it's kind of unfortunate how, like, you know, it, it really is fascinating how, like, rare George Washington-style figures are, right? These guys that are willing to get power and then set it aside. More often than not, 99% of people, right, that, that absolute corrupt, that was the saying, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people that ever achieve any amount of power become incredibly corrupt. And they just want the power for power's sake, and they're not worried about, like, what's good for the country. Meanwhile, under the influence of Chinese monarchists, who argued that the only way to ensure stability in China would be a return to traditional dynastic rule, Yuan began to seek the imperial title. However, in order to disguise his ambition, Yuan's National Congress would beg him to become emperor, with him politely declining each time, until, on November 20th, 1915, he would reluctantly accept <laughs> taking the, the name classic. of the Hongxian Emperor, ironically meaning constitutional abundance, setting January 1st, 1916 to be the first day of the Hongxian era of the new Empire of China. Yuan assumed that the general populace, as well as the international community, would support him. However, he couldn't have been more wrong. Many people in China were furious at him for this as demonstrations against him were held and many of his closest supporters turned on him. But that wasn't his main problem. 
His main problem was that he lost the support of the military, as if he were to reign as an emperor, this would mean that he wouldn't need to rely on the military for support anymore. The military governor of Yunnan province would declare- I mean, that, that's not really true, right? I mean, <clears throat> maybe in theory it's true, uh, you know, in terms of like political, you know, the, maybe the way they have it written into law is true, but the, the reality of the situation is- Politics are always enforced at the barrel of a gun or, you know, prior to a gun at the end of a sword. Uh, you know, might makes right and whoever has the most powerful military and has the backing of the military is always the one who's in reality in charge. Uh, so regardless of whether, you know, legally he needs the backing of the military, you know, the reality is he does. Declare independence, launching a revolt against Yuan, as several others followed suit, ultimately starting what would come to be known as the National Protection War. Yuan had initially gained the support of Britain and Japan, but after this, they quickly backed out and refused to give aid, and many in the Beiyang army, not having been paid yet, didn't put up a serious fight, leading to numerous defeats on the battlefield. In the end, Yuan would be forced to abdicate before dying of uremia a few months later on June 6th, 9th. What's uremia? I don't think I've ever heard of that before. You, uh, I'm probably going to spell this wrong. Uremia. Uh, build up of waste product in your blood that occurs as a result of untreated kidney failure. Oh, okay. So you had, you had kidney failure. Interesting. 1916. And with this victory, the military governors would assume full control of their respective regions as the central government lost all power, plunging China into what would be known as the Warlord Era. And it wouldn't be until after a long civil war, as well as a brutal war with Japan, that China would eventually be reunited by the Chinese Communist Party. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, Yuan Shikai's attempt at returning to dynastic rule had succeeded? Now, in our timeline, his attempt to do so was doomed from the start, so it's not possible to change anything about his brief time as emperor or the National Protection War that would allow for his reign to continue. However, there is one key thing that we could change before that, that would. The best way to do this would be to have it so that Yuan Shikai never gives provincial authority to his generals. So, as a result, when he proclaims himself to be emperor, there wouldn't be any military governors to rebel, and therefore wouldn't be any basis for the National Protection War. Now, this isn't to say that there wouldn't still be rebellions, nor that he wouldn't still lose support from his generals. There would still be rebellions, but without the pre-established militaries run by the military governors, revolutionaries wouldn't be able to mount a serious effort against Yuan Shikai, nor would his generals be interested in fighting for the revolutionaries who wanted to remove them from power anyways. Instead, Yuan Shikai's generals would probably attempt to stage a coup, ousting Yuan Shikai and placing one of their own in power instead. But for the sake of this scenario, we're going to assume that the coup attempt fails as the disloyal generals that rebelled against Yuan are arrested for treason. And once again, Yuan Shikai would cement his personal control over the government as he proceeds with his plan, being crowned as the Hongxian Emperor of the new Chinese Empire, gaining international recognition. However, it wouldn't last long though, as the Hongxian Emperor would end up passing away only a few months into his reign. Yeah, did he have any children? I guess that would be the big thing, right? Is <clears throat> I, I don't think he's mentioned any yet, but was there a dynasty for him to establish? Or is it just going to end up going back to Pu Yi? Uh, or are they just going to fall into civil war again? And depending on how old his era is, they might just fall into civil war regardless. In our timeline, after proclaiming himself emperor, the Hongxian emperor's sons, Yuan Ke Ding okay, so and Yuan Ke Wen, publicly feuded for the title of crown prince. However, Hongxian would end up giving the title to Ke Ding, who was named as Prince Yun Tai. After Hongxian's death, though, it's fair. So there probably would have been a civil war regardless if they're fighting over this, right? One of the first things that you do if you, you know, if for some way you're ever establishing a monarchy, which you probably won't be, uh, make sure you put in inheritance rules or else just watch, you know, everything turn to shit the second you die. Right? Don't do the Alexander who, go, who gets the throne to the strongest. Yeah, it probably won't end well. Very possible that Kei Wen would challenge Yuan Tai's succession, but being the eldest son, as well as Hong Xian's initial choice, it's very likely that Yuan Tai would gain more support, being crowned emperor. 
And since it's impossible to know what name he'd take, and to avoid accidentally butchering Chinese naming traditions by coming up with my own, I'm just gonna call him the Yuntai Emperor, but know that this would not have been the name he would take. Anyways, the Yuntai Emperor would continue to push for centralized authority. He would also push for industrialization and modernization of the military in order to allow China to be able to compete with Western powers, and especially Japan, as well as continuing his father's purges in the military in order to ensure loyalty. And though this would mean that a great number of talented generals would be removed, it would also ensure that the military would never rise against the imperial government again. And though the KMT would remain, Yuntai's solidified rule and foreign support for Yuntai would make them a non-issue. After World War I, it's very likely that China would begin great cooperation with Britain, Germany, and especially the United States, who would be a key ally against Japan, as China would work with Germany to help with modernization of the military. Over in Japan, they'd still probably seek expansion into China, seeing the purges as a sign of military weakness. So, in 1931, Japan once again invades Manchuria, and remembering the first Sino-Japanese War, they would expect a disorganized Chinese military to fold and surrender. However, at this point, the purges would have been over with powerful, loyal generals in place. And with strong central leadership and a good amount of industrialization and militarization over the past decade and a half, the Japanese would be crushed by the Chinese. Yeah, the population difference, if you had a even slightly modernized China, the population difference is going to be such a huge factor, right? Like, China was so backwards at the time. I mean, really, they were for, you know, up until, like, arguably the 80s, right? They had started to industrialize uh, once, you know, the, the communists take over. But, like, they really didn't get their stride into, like, what we think of as, like, modern China until the 80s. They were so ass backwards at the time. So yeah, if, like when Japan invaded. So if you even have like a slightly modernized China, that helps so much just because of the massive population. Chinese being forced back to Korea. This defeat would leave the Japanese bitter and a few years later would once again launch a massive sweeping invasion across the Chinese coast and once again into Manchuria, committing numerous dehydrations against Chinese civilians along the way. The Chinese would fight back. The thing, I don't know if they'd be <clears throat> assuming that China modernized. I mean, if depend, I guess it depends on how much they modernize. But if if they modernize to even relatively close to the same level as Japan, Japan would not be able to do this to them. Rather effectively, but it wouldn't be until the U.S. gets involved, stopping Japan outright, that China would eventually win once again. Following victory in the war, China would secure their dominance over East Asia once again as the Yuntai Emperor becomes a national hero, the savior of China. And with the dynastic system still in place, the wealthy in China would push the government to take anti-communist stances as China ends up joining the Western bloc against communism. And after the end of the Cold War, China emerges as one of the leading powers on the world stage, very likely challenging the United States for influence, not just in Asia, but around the world. In the end though, with the dynastic system intact, the Chinese Empire lives on as China maintains its ancient traditions. But in time though, as the dynastic cycle continues, the new dynasty will inevitably meet its fate. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also maybe subscribe or something. So that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya. So yeah, when it comes to like the thing you talked about there at the end about the dynasty ending, I don't know if that would happen. Like they, because of the, the just the way stuff functions now, if they had been able to establish a successful dynasty and modernized and had a massive economy and been on the right side of the you know the war the uh, you know the winning side of World War Two, then they might end up getting something like Japan or Britain, where you have this monarchy that dates back over a thousand years, right? Like obviously, the British monarchy starts in 1066, but they actually have lineages like the different you know technically they have ancestry to the older monarchs, uh, although 1066 is usually the starting date that people talk about the current monarchy. Um, and then, you know, the, the Japanese, I think there's dates back to at least the 700s. 
I could see them establishing something like that, right? Because you're not going to have like these steppe invasions that were usually what conquered the, the Chinese historically, right? Like, like the the Manchu or the Mongols or whatever. That you're not going to have those steppe invasions. So I could see them, you know, if, if they establish rule like a uh, uh, you know a monarchist rule like they you know like he wanted to. You know, it, it's hard to say because you know now we're only a hundred plus, just over a hundred years out, but. You probably could have seen something that ends up lasting like over a thousand years, like the British monarchy or the Japanese monarchy. But again, it's it, there's so many what ifs that it's hard to say, right? Alternate history. There's so many different things that could happen, uh, and then at that point, we're even looking into the future, right? That's not even alternate history. That's like theoretical futures of alternate history. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.